Okay, so chapter two is dealing with culture and culture change. So uh, chapter one, we learned about anthropology, what it is, um, some of the sub-disciplines. Um, now the rest of the class, we're gonna focus mostly on cultural anthropology um, or ethnology um, and a little bit of language. And uh, we throw in archeology span and um, you know, biological anthropology here and there. Uh, but mostly, uh, as the name of the course uh, implies, we're going to be studying culture, culture and cultural anthropology. So, some of the bullet points here of what we'll cover in uh, Chapter 2. So, um, again, uh, here are some more things that we'll cover in this chapter. And so, we talked about culture a little bit in uh, Chapter 1. Um, as kind of these uh, customary or typical ways of thinking and behaving. Um, there's lots of definitions of what culture is out there. Um, we'll go with the textbook's definition um, in chapter two, which is culture is a set of learned behaviors and ideas that are characteristic of a particular society or other shared, or excuse me, social group. So kind of the key words there are um, they're learned behaviors um, and that they're shared, um, they're characteristic of um, a particular society. So um, they can't just be individual behavior, it's something that's learned amongst the group, something that they all do and it's kind of typical or um, customary um, ways of behaving or thinking. So um, some anthropologists would include material culture in defining um, culture and in particular archaeologists um, because that's what they you know they look at the material things left behind and try to uh, <coughs> glean uh, information from it um, about culture so again culture is shared and learned so when we are born we come into a particular culture we look around at how people are acting how they're expected to act um, and we start to pick up on that, we learn it, and we share it with the group. So it's, it's shared and learned behavior. It's not uh, individual quirks that someone has, you know, like me using hand gestures, although a lot of us in this culture do um, use hand gestures, and we'll get into uh, nonverbal communication in Chapter 5. But, you know, it's, again, these kind of typical shared and learned um, behaviors and thoughts. So... Uh, looking at the first one here, culture is commonly shared. Um, the size of a group within which cultural traits are shared can vary from a particular society or a segment of that society uh, to a group that transcends national boundaries. So the textbook likes to call um, it the North American culture and it includes the United States and Canada as a culture. Um, so it's transcending natural boundaries. So. Um, although Canadians do things a little bit differently than we do in the U.S. and throughout different regions of the U.S. we do things differently. We, we typically or commonly um, do these things as a whole um, and it's something that it's a shared um, thinking or a shared um, behavior and so um, that makes us comfortable because um, you know culture kind of exists and we don't really think about it and it brings about kind of a psychological comfort in that we know what to expect of people um, in a particular situation and they know what to expect from us. So not only is it shared, but it's learned. Again, um, you know, when we're, when we're born, we kind of have a clean slate, um, but depending on what culture we're brought up in, we, we learn how to think and behave according to what the culture expects. So um, probably the most powerful transmitter of culture is language. So that's, even though other animals um, exhibit learned and shared behavior, which we would might deem as culture amongst that particular group of animals, um, it's, it's through communication that humans, it's, it's really the powerful transmitter of culture. So, um, you know, again, as, you, as a little kid, you watch and you see what you're, um, parents and friends and other people are doing and learn how to behave but um, you also can be told hey you know you're not supposed to do that we don't do that in this culture um, you know of course we wouldn't say that um, specifically but that's you know kind of the driving force behind it so again you know culture has lots of uh, different definitions and 
kind of, you know, these controversies arise over what is the concept of culture. And um, one of the disagreements is whether the concept of culture should uh, refer to just the rules and ideas behind behavior, or if it should also include the behaviors or products of the behavior. So again, um, you know, just as in any academic discipline, people get bogged down on kind of these um, conceptual ideas and operational definitions and that sort of thing. Um, we won't get too bogged down on that, but just know that, you know, it's hard for, um, for as an academic discipline to come together and say, you know, this is what culture is. <clears throat> so culture, I just mentioned, it kind of brings us this psychological comfort, but it also kind of constrains our behavior. Um, you know, so you might think of someone you might call a rebel, you know, so they're kind of acting outside of the cultural constraints. And Durkheim stressed that culture is something kind of outside us, exerting a strong cohesive power on us. Coercive, excuse me, not cohesive, um, although it is, does kind of bring us together. Um, co coercive power on us. So, um, again, it brings a psychological comfort, but it also kind of restricts our behavior. Um, you know, not everyone would agree with Durkheim. Um, but um, it, it is a powerful, um, culture is a powerful thing that kind of, again, exists in the background that we don't really think too much about. And so you might have heard of this um, word norms before, you know. So norms are just these standards or rules about what is acceptable behavior. And, you know, this is kind of what we expect from you in this situation. And if you go outside of that, you're, you, you're, you're going beyond the cultural um, constraining that is trying to occur there. And you're kind of breaking these ex rules that we've kind of either formally or informally come up with. So kind of some attitudes that hinder the study of culture. Um, there's going to be two really important terms from this chapter and this class, so um, take note of these for sure. Um, the terms are ethnocentrism, which we'll discuss here, and the next one is cultural relativism, which is kind of its counterpart. So ethnocentrism is when you judge other cultures solely in terms of your own um, culture. So um, if you've ever studied, you know, maybe an African culture, or a, you know, some uh, uh, culture in Asia, and they do some kind of practice that um, you find just bizarre or, you know, maybe offensive or whatever it might be, um, in that case, you're kind of applying a judgment to those people based off of what you're comfortable with and not comfortable with in your own culture. So that's called ethnocentrism. So, um, you know, it's kind of seen as a, a, a bad thing in that it hinders the study of culture. So if you're being judgmental, you can't really, you know, objectively look at it at a um, culture and you're um, kind of <clears throat> applying your own standards to it. Um, it's it's something, you know, kind of that would be a no-no for a cultural anthropologist, but I think it's instinctual for us to, um, you know, to look at something and say, oh, you know, that's weird or, um, you know, that makes me uncomfortable, that sort of thing. Um, so although it's, you know, kind of a natural reaction sometimes, um, as a cultural anthropologist, you kind of want to say, okay, I'm being a little judgmental here, you know, why do they do this particular thing? And so rather, you know, it would be best to come from a uh, approach of cultural relativism, which is an anthropological attitude towards a society's customs and ideas. And so basically that means it should just be understood within the context of that culture and should be looked at more objectively and um, without judgment, so kind of suspending your own judgment and um, taking on this kind of cultural relativism and just examining it with the con within the context of its own culture. Um, but here we have a problem as well. So can the concept of cultural relativism be reconciled with the concept of an international code of human rights? Um, so let's say, um, let's take maybe um, Nazi Germany, um, so 1940s, uh, German culture, nationalism, um, you know, so the Nazis were killing um, millions of people um, and that would be, you know, their a cultural practice that they are doing. Um, now should we be culture, cultural relativists about this and say, oh, you know, let's not be judgmental, let's, let's uh, look at it within the context of that culture, um, or is that breaking an international code of human rights? So again, there's 
um, you know, strict cultural relativism, and then you know this this line of is it breaking um, kind of this international code of human rights. So cultural anthropologists look at describing a culture. So again, culture is is this typical shared and learned behavior of a particular group of people in a particular area. And so, you know, individual variation is, you know, across the board, you know, so, you know, right now I could, uh, you know, start making monkey noises and you wouldn't, you know, just because I wanted to be weird, um, that wouldn't be typical of what you were expecting um, because in culture, you know, we have these general expectations, but individual variation, um, you know, is, is uh, limitless. Um, but typically, behaviors have socially acceptable boundaries on that variation. So again, these kind of cultural constraints um, that we know, you know, I know it's expected of me to just talk about the slides and not make monkey noises, um, but as a human being, I could certainly do that. Um, but um, it's not socially acceptable, it's not what you expect, and I'm not going to do that. So, <laughs> so you know, it's because of those cultural constraints um, you know, it tends to um, take individual variation and make it more acceptable, although individuals, um, again, their behavior is limitless. So a cultural anthropologist wouldn't want to just study one person from a culture because that particular person is going to have their own individual behaviors that they do within the culture. So um, when you describe a culture, you want to look at kind of the average, the, the modal pattern, the most common behavior amongst the individuals in a population. So again, it's shared behavior. It's not individual behavior. Um, it's individuals acting within um, cultural ideals, ideals, um, those sorts of things. So, you know, for example, if you were going to study how far apart two people are from each other when they talk to one another. Um, you know, and, th and this does vary cross-culturally. In some cultures, you know, you're, you're right next to one another. In other cultures, they expect you to be further apart. Um, but you wouldn't want to just look at two people having one conversation in a culture and say, oh, yep, that's how far they stand apart. You want to look at a group uh, or a number, a sample of people, you know, and get the average. Um, so take, I don't know if you're Seinfeld fans, but if you've ever seen the Close Talker um, episode where he's, you know, right up in Jerry's face, um, you know, that's not normal, and you can tell that from the uh, episode, you know, that it gets laughs because uh, in our culture we don't get right up in someone's face when we're talking. So you want to kind of, you wouldn't want to just look at that guy, the close talker, you'd want to get a general idea or kind of this modal pattern, the most frequent type of behavior. So um, culture is also integrated. Um, the elements or traits that make up that culture are not just random. They're not a random assortment of customs, um, but they're mostly adjusted to or consistent with one another. So um, all these cultural behaviors and thoughts and ideas are all working together um, to bring about the same cultural expectations. So, um, now these cultural expectations, this shared and learned behavior is generally adaptive. And when I say adaptive, think of this in kind of a Darwin sense, um, you know, survival of the fittest, theory of evolution, that sort of thing. Um, adaptive traits versus maladaptive traits. Now the, the group that's getting together and sharing and learning and behaving and acting in this way um, is not going to survive if they're acting in a way that's maladaptive, you know, the, you know, kind of diminish the chances of survival and reproduction. So again, from a, a Darwin standpoint, um, you know, adaptive customs help enhance survival, um, enhance um, your ability to reproduce offspring, and enhance the culture, the group of people within it. Um, you know, you can look at cultures like um, Easter Island or the Anasazi in the Southwest, and actually a good book is um, Collapse by Jared Diamond if, if you're interested in this. So these kind of societies that somehow or another develop these maladaptive customs that um, cause the culture to disappear. So how and why cultures change? Um, cultures usually change slowly. There can be some kind of external event like maybe say 9-11 
in the United States, I think, was an external event that changed our culture. Um, there can be internal changes, um, but a lot of times it's based on discovery and invention. So, you know, back when I was a kid, cell phones were, were not a thing, but now they are very much a thing, and I'm guessing every person who's watching this has their own cell phone and has probably looked at it within the last uh, two minutes um, while they're listening to me talk. Um, so discovery and invention brings about cultural change. Um, diffusion, which is um, you know, the sharing or spreading of ideas and acculturation when one culture moves into with another culture or next to that sort of thing. So to look at these um, a little in a little more detail here, um, with discovery and invention, there's kind of these um, serendipitous unconscious inventions um, that occur. There's an intention, you know, intentional inventions. Um, you know, you look at um, you know how much it takes off. You know, is this particular innovation going to spread? Um, sometimes these innovations happen without us really knowing about it. So. You know, it might be some kind of innovation in food technology um, that, you know, is, is uh, cost effective and um, brings about uh, a lot of food for a lot of people. Um, and we may, as consumers, just, you know, not really know what's going on behind the scenes, but it does, um, you know, kind of affect um, our food um, getting strategy and our food intake and ideas about food. So you kind of weigh the costs and benefits of these inventions. And hopefully, you know, they're adaptive, not maladaptive. So diffusion, then, is another way cultures change, and it's a process where um, cultural elements are borrowed from another culture or spread from one culture to another. Um, and this can happen through direct contact. Um, with globalization and the Internet the way it is, this is happening much more rapidly than it did in the past. So, you know, when um, two cultures came together for the first time, Oh, you know, look what they're doing. Yeah, look what they're doing. You know, sharing ideas. Um, so it could be through direct contact, or maybe you know, this culture over here meets this culture, and then this culture meets this culture, and spread through intermediate contact, or um, kind of this uh, stimulus diffusion, um, where you um, like take, for example, um, the book gives the example of um, you know, so the uh, Native American tribes didn't have a written language, but um, if you see, oh, you know, the the Europeans they have a written language. Let's write our language down, um, you know, through being stimulated through what somebody else is doing, that sort of thing. Another way cultures change is through acculturation. So you've got um, changes that occur when different cultural groups come into intensive contact. So maybe. Um, it's a, a migration thing um, where you've got one culture moving in with another culture um, and eventually they become, go through this process of acculturation where it's usually the dominant um, culture, you know, the, the subordinate culture is usually picking up a lot of stuff from the dominant culture, although the dominant culture will also pick up things. Um, so one of the so societies in contact is much more powerful than the other and again, um, you know, it's usually the dominant culture that will overtake um, or eventually the culture of the subordinate people will um, start to disappear and they'll start to take on more of the cultural traits of the dominant culture. So um, some conditions that may give rise uh, to rebellion and revolution, um, so these would be more um, abrupt changes in culture would be maybe loss of prestige of established authority. So, you know, the group of people is like, is uh, tired of the ruling class. Um, they're having an economic issue. Um, maybe the government, uh, indecisive government, that's one that we might deal with here in, uh, in uh, the United States here, but I don't know if I particularly see rebellion or revolution coming, but. Um, or maybe loss of support of the intellectual class. Um, so these things might bring about revolution, which is more abrupt internal change. So um, again, these customs are not genetically inherited. So this is the, you know, you've heard the nature versus nurture debate. This is the, um, the nurture part of it. So it's not genetically inherited. Um, it's similar to it. 
Yeah. So because we learn it and we share it and, you know, passes from one generation to the next. Um, if the culture is generally adapted to its environment, then culture change should also be generally uh, adaptive as well. So again, most cultural practices are adaptive. So I mentioned globalization a little while ago, um, the spread of cultural features around the world, so that uh, diffusion is happening much more rapidly today. Um, um, but it doesn't mean that it's incorporated in exactly the same way. So one particular, you know, through globalization we're open to all these ideas, but some cultures may take on um, another culture's um, ideas in a new way compared to um, another culture. So here would be an example of um, globalization and worldwide communication. Um, so technology is such that we can spread ideas, we can spread cultural traits, um, behaviors, etc. Um, and really it's kind of putting cultural anthropologists out of business, you know, so we, hopefully we don't one day just have this one big culture. Um, you know, and it, it's uh, nice to have cultural variation and and people doing different things in, in different areas. So, um, cultures come and go. I mentioned Jared Diamond's book, Collapse and the Disappearance of Cultures. Well, new cultures pop up as well. And this is called um, ethnogenesis. So it's a process whereby new cultures are created and it's usually in the aftermath of violent events such as depopulation, re relocation, enslavement, or, and or gen genocide. So when some of these kind of um, extreme, tragic um, things happen, new cultures can emerge out of those. So again, the process of globalization is minimizing cultural diversity. You know, you probably heard if you've taken an environmental science class, um, the term biodiversity before. So you know, the, the um, which deals with the amounts of different species in a particular area. Well, there's also cultural diversity. And just as biodiversity is minimizing, so is cultural diversity. Um, however, in the last 30 years or so, it's become increasingly apparent that many people are affirming their ethnic identity. So it's kind of people are realizing, hey, I'm losing my um, ethnic identity here. I want to um, kind of go back to my more traditional ways, and I don't want to become like everybody else. So that's chapter two in a nutshell. Um, and if, again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email. Thanks.